superstars. Um, did I just come back from gym or did I forget my horse clothes? What's going on here? This episode, guys, is all about the secrets to success when you're riding. One part of riding is the knowledge. The other part of riding is the doing. But the biggest part of knowledge is being able to apply your knowledge and actually do it. So I am going to give you all of the secrets to success off your horse. This was an online seminar that had thousands of people enter. Um, so it is live. So therefore the footage is a little bit crackly. It breaks in and out sometimes because it's all on the internet, but you will get to experience a really real life live session where people from all over the world were asking me questions about their seat, their position, exercises they can do. So get in there guys, really enjoy it. Really, you know, get yourself a bucket of popcorn and a bit of a milkshake and sit in your bed and watch it because it's really long but it is epic and if I don't say so myself quite slightly entertaining at times <laughs> so get in enjoy it underneath in the description is some timestamps and some really key moments so if you're not in a spot where you can just watch it through check into those timestamps and have a look hope you enjoy it guys bye While we're waiting for everyone to sort of clean it all up. You ask me some questions, baby. Okay. So some people say, even though you've got weight in the stirrups, I hear that. Mm -hmm. If you push up from in the trot, would you push up from the weight of the stirrups? Mm -hmm. Is that correct or incorrect? If not, where do you push up from? Where do you rise from? Do okay. you rise from your pelvis or from your feet in your stirrups? Okay. So that's a really, really good question. It is your feet in your stirrups, okay? However, what you've got to be aware of, and let me get my prop out again, guys. Oof. Right. So it is your feet in your stirrups, but if you're standing in a stirrup like this, yeah, and yep. you've got your heel jammed right down, yep. it's really easy to then like use it as a leverage so yep. when you rise, you kind of go up and down like that. And the, the height of the rise comes from your leg moving, if that makes sense. That's not right. What you want it to be is like you're standing on the floor, okay? Yeah. And you go down, you go up. You go down, you go up. You go down, you go up. That power comes from your feet but all of your other legs are act, the body, all of your other muscles are activated. So it's not that the length of your seat is coming because your, your toe is changing. And you need to feel what it feels like on the ground. Do that exercise that I showed you guys, like this, yeah? And then when you get on your horse, replicate that feeling very important that your foot doesn't actually do the work that it's the feeling of you standing on the ground not your oh sorry I should say not your ankle that does the work it's your solidness on the ground does that make a bit of sense yeah I'll, I'll, yeah? Give, that a, I'll give that a go tomorrow Diane Butler did you work it out I saw you before there you are can you work out how to get yourself off mute yeah, yes, it. you got it. <laughs> so, do you, have any other, do you have any questions, Diane? Yeah, I mean, obviously, because I've got the big boobs and I can relate to it. So, the, the pelvis is obviously a really important part. And I try, I'm really trying because I do have a bit of a back injury. Yeah. But I'm being treated. But I do find the, the feet in the stirrups is a really big thing for me. Um, I don't lose my stirrups anymore. But so, should you? your stirrup your feet should really be flat not heels down and yes yes you don't want yes diane you don't you just want them to be neutral yeah you don't want them to be jammed down yeah and you don't want them to be up you just yep. want neutral just neutral yep. in your leg and yeah you do put the the stirrup on the ball of your foot that's correct that's yep. where it does sit but it's neutral yeah yeah Does that's that, that was yeah yeah and that weight in your legs is I, I i just wanted to say that 
I have been doing that. The weight in my legs has made me feel so much more confident that my feet are absolutely planted. And when my mare does the giraffe thing or leaps forward or sideways or whatever, I feel like I'm not going anywhere. It's, it's just brilliant. amazing. It's brilliant. So my confidence, because I've been doing the, the fearless mastery as well with Tash. I just say, Tash, you've saved my riding career. That was fabulous. But I just feel so much more confidence with this athletic horse that three years ago, I would never imagine I could have ridden. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just been a massive journey. So thank you both. That that warms both our hearts. And 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 I, I think what people have to understand as well is most fear when you're riding is real. Like for mm. me, it's not, you know, arachnophobia for a um a huntsman that's never gonna hurt you. It's not an irrational fear. It's a rational fear. Mm. Being afraid of horse riding is completely rational. Um, so really the best way to not be afraid is to not think you're going to fall off. Yeah. And the best way to do that is to get better. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Cause sometimes she can be really, um, she's, you know, she's not naughty, but she just finds it difficult and she can be a bit, you know, unpredictable. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, I was riding you yesterday after speaking to you in the morning and, you know, she was being a bit toey. Yeah. Um, and she can be, you know, good one day, fabulous one day and, you know, awful the next. And I was getting quite frustrated. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I remember that also the conversation that you had with, um, that Megan had with Olivia about, you know, frustration and everything. So I just grounded myself and I thought, well, my keep your feet grounded because nothing is going to happen. And, you know, there was thunder off in the, you know, and I would normally have just got off in the yeah. thunder. Yeah. And I didn't. And I just I'm thought, so excited. Oh. It's awesome. Yeah. So Thank you for great. sharing that, Diane, because that will just help people. And when Diane says that she was talking to me, um, we she's in dressage mastery. So in dressage mastery, um, we have, I think it's eight or nine study groups every single week. Um, and I'm actually do a lot of them. So people actually get to be with me on Zoom. There's only maybe 20 people in the max. I don't get, they're only small groups and you can like send videos and things like that. So people like Diane, even though we've got thousands of members, I get to get to know them actually, which is just really cool. And I get to see videos and it's, it's just amazing. And it's this great little community. I love it. It's amazing. So. Anyway, um, so thank you for, um, for sharing that, Diane. All right, guys. So I want to go through exactly where you sit for key movements, okay? So if we start with preliminary and work our way up, even though a lot of you might not be pre-St. George Grand Prix, et cetera, it's always good to begin with the end in mind and understand what is happening, okay? And so that's why I want to teach you everything, because if you understand what's going to happen in the future, then you have much more of an idea of what to do when you're preparing for the future. Ultimately, it's going to put another layer on. So the first thing to understand is how to use your seat and where your seat should be for certain paces. So for walk, trot and canter. Okay. Now, one of the biggest mistakes that people make with walk is they thrust. So they do a backward and forward motion, okay? It's not a backward and forward motion. And that's why loads of people accidentally get a canter, okay, when they're trying to make their walk bigger. You know, they're trying to make their walk bigger and then the horse breaks to canter. That's because they're thrusting. Okay, so with your seat, when you're walking, your pelvis doesn't go backwards and forwards. It actually goes like a square. Now, in reality, if you start to think of a square, you're not quick enough and it's a bit confusing and you kind of like end up doing a bit of a circle. So actually, if you just think of when, you, when you're in a walk position, when you're just doing walk, that you go... 
pelvis back to the left, forward to the right, back to the left, forward to the right, back to the left, forward to the right. And if you're going in the opposite direction or, um, or you go uh, outside back, inside forward, outside back, inside forward. So it's like a diagonal twist almost. I'm obviously exaggerating it so that you can see it. It's not this. It's this, it's back, forward, back, forward, back, forward. And then if I do that in a realistic way, so you can't really see it, that's what you're doing when you're walking. So in walk, it's not thrusting backward and forward. It's square, but technically in practice, because it's not possible really to do a square, it's Outside first, back, inside second, front. Outside back, inside front. And you just keep doing that. If you want the horse to go faster and you need to use your seat, you actually just do that quicker. It's as simple as that. And that's how you can get a more active, bigger walk when you're doing your extenders and things in tests and the horse won't break to canter because you're clearly doing a different movement in your pelvis versus this thrust, okay? That's the first thing. The next one is trot, okay? Now, sitting trot and rising trot. Now, rising trot's obvious, isn't it? It's up and down. You're posting. When you sit, it's exactly the same, except you don't rise. So you think of your pelvis that it goes up and down. And what it might be is it's just that you sort of don't move it. So if you want your horse to trot from walk, you'd go from this, like this, with your pelvis, to this. Okay, and in the beginning, that might be simply just that you stand up, that you start rising. As the horse gets more educated, it's just that your seat gets taller, that you whoo, stand up a little bit, you get taller, your diaphragm gets bigger. You just try to think my pelvis comes up, actually, up and straight. That is trot. Okay, and that's what actually gets you to go from cancer to trot seamlessly as well. Understanding that it's not the handbrake, it's your seat. I go from a backward forward thrusting motion in a canter to a lifting my diaphragm up, lifting my pelvis up and making it long and up. That's it. Just like that. It's that simple. Right? Is that not cool? Yeah, canter is backward and forward. So you do get to thrust at some point, <laughs> but only in the canter. And I can't reiterate that enough, guys. And it's not this. Yeah, <laughs> it's just a little bit. It's just with the horse, it's not your actual hip moving. So it's not your pelvis going from, it's not this. Yeah, and yet I've got my pelvis in the correct position. And when I'm moving with the horse, my pelvis moves with the horse, not this. Yeah, my pelvis is in the right spot and I move with the horse. But my actual hip don't move backward and forward. Just my pelvis moving with the horse. So walk. Trot, canter. Trot, walk, canter. Walk, trot, walk, canter. All of a sudden, hopefully, guys, that would have made your brains go. That's why my horse trots. That's why my horse jogs. That's why I have mistakes because there is a clear pattern that you need to use to be able to walk, trot and canter. And now you know it. Who knew? Now you know it, okay? If you want your horse to go bigger in the walk, 
You just make your seat what you want the horse to do. So if you wanted a smaller walk, you go quicker. So like a piaf or half steps, you're going to go quicker in your seat. Same motion, but quicker. If you want a horse to be more collected in the trot, you're going to go taller in your diaphragm, taller in your pelvis. If you want a horse to take a bigger step in the canter, you're going to make a longer, slower thrust. And if you want your horse to be more collected in the canter, you're going to do a smaller, quicker, more often thrust. Whatever you want the legs to do, you replicate with your pelvis. Okay, that simple. So that's the first part that you need to know. Were there any main qu major questions in there at all? Um, anyone, Tash or um, Danielle? Uh, yeah, we've got, can you show the trots and also the canter movements while you're standing? Oh, I think I did that. So I've done that. Okay. Um, is that why you kick on, is that why you kick on side at the time? Why you maybe. keep on side at the time? Maybe she meant one side at a time. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure what that. I'm not sure about that one. Re, whoever wrote that, rewrite that again because I don't understand it. Maybe we can see it again. One more, yeah. maybe Tash. Um, how to do rising trot? The way you're showing from the ground, your knees move in the saddle. They can't move like this. Yeah. Ah, yes. So. Well, you, your knees can move. Do you mean th them flexing? You can't, your, your knees do, 100%. When you're riding in your seat, when you're in a rising trot, okay, this is literally what happens. That is what happens when you do a rise. Your knee, my knee does move a little bit. I can't stop it. It stays in one spot, but the, 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 it does flex and release, flex and release a little bit. Your knee does bend a little bit, okay? You'd be quite surprised. And again, in the course, there's, there's videos of me doing it in the saddle. So you actually get to see it in the saddle, okay? Because it's not possible for your knee not to flex when you rise up and down. You will get some flexion. We don't want you locking your knee out, don't get me wrong, and doing this. But you do get an element of movement to it. That does happen, okay? All right, so then you know how to walk, trot and canter. And I know that sounds really simple, but I have worked with small tour riders, into one riders that don't know that. They don't know that. They made it all the way to into one and they don't understand why the horses are breaking in the extended walks um, or why they can't get their walk pirouettes good. It's because they didn't know that there's a rhythm to your seat or an action to your seat for each pace. Hmm? It's pretty brilliant. Okay, so then you want to understand the next things. So if you're then riding a circle, there is still an element that you have to understand to place your seat for the circle. Okay, so ideally, when you're riding a circle, you are sitting with the backbone in the very middle of your bottom. Okay, so again, I can't think of, I, I, I wish I could find a cleaner way to say this, but everyone can understand it. Your bottom crack is directly over the top of the horse's backbone. Now, what often happens when we turn a circle is that if the horse is not turning that circle correctly, so they're falling to the outside or they're falling to the inside, we as riders will go, will automatically head toward where the biggest surface area is on the horse. So if you're riding a circle and he starts to drift out, his outside rib cage is the biggest surface area because his outside rib cage starts to flex out when he falls out, okay? So as riders, we very easily end up sitting out there and no longer straddling the backbone exactly okay and it happens without our knowledge it's just a subconscious thing our bodies just go to where there's more surface area okay so when you're riding a circle you 100% must be sitting right centered over the backbone okay that backbone is right in the middle of your area right in the middle of your pelvis 
okay? Then, because you know actually what the effect of your weight can do, if you do have a horse that is falling out or in, you can then actually move yourself away from that small, that backbone area to stop him drifting. So for example, if your horse is falling in, okay, like this, if we sit out here, that helps him stay upright. That helps him from falling over. So you can lift up your seat a little bit and move it to maybe that much to the inside of his backbone, okay? If you do that, he will straighten up and then you'll end up back in the middle. So all that might sound quite complicated, but again, in the videos, you'll see it. But what that gets you to do is gets you to be aware. And all of a sudden, when they start drifting, when they start falling in, when they start to bulge their shoulders out or you end up with a big oval, you can actually make changes in your seat that makes a difference. Whereas we often end up struggling with our reins or our legs, trying to push them sideways or stop them falling out. So often you're just not centered over that backbone. So I can't reiterate that enough. You need to be centered over the backbone when you're riding a circle, okay? Obviously you need to be there when you're riding a straight line as well. But when you turn a circle, the inside rib cage becomes smaller. The outside rib cage becomes bigger. That's just what happens because of the line. And as, I, and as I said, if you're unaware of where you need to sit, your body moves to the biggest surface area, which is the outside. Any bright minds blowing at the moment? Anyone going, oh my God? I can't say, I can't see it. <laughs> Any questions there, Tash, for me? Yeah, mine's exploded. Um, yes, keep it simple. You explain it very well. Um, where was there? Uh, do you find that a little bit of two point will help you to find the ground in the saddle? Who said that? Caitlin. Caitlin. Caitlin, give her a pair of reins as well, Tash. Caitlin. That is a brilliant question. And yes, it does. Two-point position is such an amazing tool to reset you, to reset you to feel the ground. Yes, Caitlin, genius. I don't know if you stole that from me before or whether you came up with that yourself, but if you've come up with that yourself, brilliant. And if you stole it from me, even more brilliant because you retain the knowledge. Good work, you. <laughs> but it makes such a difference. I was teaching Toby recently and Toby's my, one of my senior riders and he's an into one rider. He's not a beginner, you know, and I use two point with him because what he'll often do is when the horse starts to get a sticky, when the horse starts to um, not want to go anymore, he'll grab with his legs and drive, 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 drive. And it's just an ingrained habit for him. So I've actually taught him to go into two-point position when he gets like that. And then I actually get him to play with the tempo of the canter, bringing it big and even so small that I can walk beside him while he's in two-point. And then you know that the horse is on your aid and that you're not forcing it with your seat. Two-point position is an amazing, amazing reset tool. So, Caitlin, email us so we can send you a set of reins. Brilliant question. Brilliant. Anything else at that low level there? With a yeah. circle? Um, from Josie, when they're falling in, should we counterbalance or go with their falling so they have to self preserve and center themselves? I think you said earlier not to counterbalance. Exactly. Don't counterbalance. Don't help them. Who was that? Josie. Josie. Josie, don't help them 100%. Because what you want to do is always think when you're training your horses and you're learning to ride, you've got to think with the end in mind. Even if you don't want to be a Grand Prix rider one day, the process is still the same. So if you want to go from prelim to a medium horse or prelim even, and your goal is just to get the best prelim score you can get, 
the process to do that and to ride a Grand Prix horse is exactly the same. It's not different. And that's the beauty of this sport. So think if you're a Grand Prix rider, if you're needing to counterbalance them and help them, how hard it would be to get around a test. And you'd always be just reliant on how strong you were or how quick you were to catch them. Always let, let the horses travel by themselves. And we hear that, that expression self-carriage and it often gets misinterpreted in the rain. It's actually very little to do with the bridle and more to do with them standing on all four legs all by themselves, if that makes sense. It really, really does. So no, you never, ever help them. You actually hinder them. You, bait, you make it uncomfortable for them to be in the position that they want to be in without you asking so that they actually go back to where you want them voluntarily. It's a little bit like reverse psychology with the, with the kids, you know? <laughs> Fine, if you want to go to the inside, come on, come to the inside. And then they go, oh, no, I don't want to be there. That's uncomfortable. And they go straight again versus saying, straighten up, straighten up, straighten up, straighten up. And then they'll just fight you the whole way. Okay. Same with a horse that gallops off on you, a horse that's quick. We often want to put the handbrake on. Very much, very often, if you just ask them to go quicker than what they want to go, they're like, ow, well, that didn't work. Okay, I'll go slower. <laughs> One more question there, Tashi. Yeah, from Crystal. When you drift in and you move your leg and you move your seat, do you back it up with leg to move them back to the line? No. And a brilliant question, Crystal, was it? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant question, Crystal. No. The horse will set themselves back up. Think about, and, and you have to reestablish your line. So um, I'm just trying to think of the best way to articulate this. So if you're riding a circle and your horse has fallen in on the circle, okay, once you've got them to stop falling in, that's step one. So wherever you end up, when you just, when you fix step one, that's where you end up. So for example, if you're doing a 20 minute circle and you end up five meters off the wall, that's not relevant yet. All that's relevant is you stop it from getting further than five meters. So wherever you stop them from falling in is where you are. Then if you want to then continue a 20 meter circle, you don't use your leg to push them back to the line because that would be too difficult. That would be a leg yield. So all you do is you just draw a new line and slowly make your way back out to where you want to be. So you don't go sideways. You slowly make your way back out. So let me move and actually show you that. So move my chair. So if you're walking a circle, riding a circle, okay, this is the size that you want the circle, your horse starts to fall in, okay? You get into a point where he stops falling in, which is here, but I want my circle to be touching this mat, okay? What I don't do is then push him back to the mat. I don't do that, okay? I go, right, he was falling in, I've stopped him from falling in, my goal is, is that the point of my circle is the width of that mat or to the mat. So that might be my wall. So I just make my circle bigger by showing the shoulder where to go. So that by the time I reach my mat again, I'm actually in the right place. Versus getting back to the mat. Just take your time and with the shoulder, draw a new circle line. Did that make sense to you and Tash and Daddy? Because I can't get the feedback from everybody else or is there feedback from everybody else going, I understand? Yep, no, that's good. So that is how you walk, trot, canner, ride a circle, okay? The next thing you need to learn is just how to strike canter. And you just need to remember that when you strike canter, it's the outside hind leg that is the leading leg, okay? So ideally, you don't do anything. 
you just stay passive. So how you are when you're trotting or you're walking, it's just passive. However, if you have a horse that's a bit sticky and, and struggles to find that cantilever, struggles to lift that outside hind, okay, all you have to do is give him a little bit of space with your seat. Now, it's definitely not this. I must reiterate that. It's definitely not that the weight in your feet changes. You definitely have even weight, but you can literally just lift your seat up a little bit, put it a little bit off center to the rib cage. Sorry, not the rib cage, the um, backbone. So that there's more space for the horse's back and hind leg to lift up to allow him to canter. That's the first reason why it makes a difference. The second reason why it makes a difference is we learn on the circle that if you sit to the inside a little bit when the horse is falling to the inside, he will start to even himself out and go out again. Now, if a horse isn't cantering for you, the reason for that always is for one reason or another, he doesn't have enough weight on his outside hind leg. So if you put a little bit of weight to the inside, and I'll re, actually I'll reword that, you reposition your body slightly to the inside, slightly off center to the backbone. The horse starts to put more weight to the outside to counteract your weight, i.e. more weight in his outside height can canter all of a sudden. What the? Boom. That can be the difference between a horse that can canter or not. I can't describe to you how much, how important that piece of knowledge is. It will make such a difference to you. Yeah? Heads exploding. The numbers aren't dropping down, so that's probably a good sign. It's so hard to do this on Zoom because I get no expression from anybody's faces and I can't see the comments either. So all I, the only thing I, the only measure I have as to whether I'm helping you or not is to whether the participants are dropping off. <laughs> so I have got, to entertain myself. Is there any comments there, Tash, that you think a bit ah holy that might help? Yeah, we've got that's amazing. And Mimi's like, say that again. You know, when someone says something and you're just like, oh, my God, brain's got to catch up to that. Let Mimi's me repeat that. that. Let me repeat it, it because it is gold, okay? Let me preface this with when you get this system, when you understand how your body affects the horse, everything kind of rolls into one. So what you learn at prelim then that knowledge rolls into the next level and the next level and the next level. So it's all like the sliding scale. It's the same thing with um, Dressage Mastery Academy. When people understand the training scale, everything just flows together. So by the time you get to pre-St. George, you're not in such a lost phase. It's all just a bigger version of what you did at prelim, okay? So we learnt that if your horse falls in on the circle, if you sit, put weight, move your seat rather to the inside. So move your seat so you're not, not centered to the, the backbone. You and the horse have got weight to the inside. So the horse will counteract that to balance himself and be more upright or a little bit more to the outside. If you, you practice that same principle when your horse won't canter, your horse won't canter, you take your seat, you position it slightly to the inside, okay? You have both weight through your stirrups. Because you have put your position to the inside slightly, your horse will counterbalance straight or more upright, which puts more weight in his outside hind leg. More weight in his outside hind leg is the only reason why your horse won't canter. There might be different reasons why there's not enough weight in his outside hind, but actually that'll be the only reason. So you can all of a sudden give his legs space if he's weak, but also get him to put weight on his more weight in his outside hind without asking him to. 
It's just a natural reaction from him. Cool, hey? Right? Did that answer the question again after I repeated that, do you think, Tatch? Yes, I think we're good. Awesome. Okay. So all of a sudden there, guys, your walk, trot, canter, know how to do the strike of canter, know how to ride circles. Next step is we start laterals. Okay. Leg yield is the first one. Now, how many people get to the center line and ride a leg yield and they think I've got to push my horse sideways. I've got to get my horse to the wall. So you find yourself riding along and you want to get to the wall and you're like this. Come on, horse. Get. You feel like you're taking him over to the wall, right? We know physics. We know that we are never, ever, ever going to succeed if we have to make a horse do something. It's not possible. We can't make a horse do anything. We're all peanuts. We're tiny compared to them. So if you think I'm trying to get my horse to do a leg yield by going, come over here or pushing with my legs and I'm trying to push his body over there, it's never going to work. And if it does, it's not going to be harmonious in self-carriage, easy. You hear, go to a mass classes and all you hear is, you want the horse in self-carriage, you want the horse in self-carriage, you want the horse in self-carriage. Our brains think bridle. It's nothing to do with the bridle or it has very little to do with the bridle. It's to do with them moving in places for you by themselves. So if you want a horse to leg you to the wall, you come up the center line. You position your body. Again, you just move the center of your pelvis off to the inside. And the further you move it, the more unbalanced the horse will become, i.e. the steeper he will go. And all you have to do is come onto the center line, line his shoulders up with a letter, just like you would do if it was a diagonal line. And if you go from the center of his rib, oh, his, his backbone to slightly over, you create all of this space here and you make him slightly unbalanced this way. So to counteract that, he will try to fill up this gap and become more upright. And all you have to do is tell the shoulder where to go, which is exactly the same as a diagonal line. So if you want to ride a leg yield, the aid, a basic leg yield, the basic aid is go to X on the center line and then go X to K on a diagonal line. And simply to make it leg yield, you just add, move my seat to the inside and your horse will just go on, go on the diagonal line in a leg yield, just like that. And literally when I first did this course, People, and I said, there's a video where I talk all about this and people got into the quick Q&A afterwards. And again, this is the brilliance of it. You can do the Q&A with me and talk to me. They literally said I was going to ask for my money back because I watched that bit and I'm like, they're like, it's not going to work. But you try it anyway, don't you? Even if it is just to sort of prove me wrong, not one person couldn't do it. It just works instantly. So imagine that. Think about how complicated leg yield's been for you over the years. Now think, can you ride a diagonal line, just a regular diagonal line from X to K? Yes or no? I'm pretty sure everybody can. To make that leg yield, add, take my seat from over, straddling over the rib cage to over slightly. If you do that, your horse will leg yield. It's as simple as that because he moves away from your seat and fills up the space while you're telling him in the shoulders to ride a diagonal line. It's that easy. It's that easy. Hmm? Boom. Wow. What? Anything there, Tashi? Yes. They're, um, they, they take a while to just, they're all 
processing. Amazing. Got it. Boom. Sounds so easy, but how do you keep in parallel? Ah, now that is an amazing question. You don't is the answer. In a novice test, it's not supposed to be parallel. When the judges say it needs to be more parallel, they're not actually wanting complete parallel. So when we ride a leg yield for a Grand Prix horse, it's never in the test, obviously, but we use it as gymnastic exercise. Yeah, we might go quite sideways, but we never go from E to B. It's always a diagonal line. It might just be quite steep. So for example, it might be from X to R, which is a 12 meter um, diagonal line. It's steeper than a 30 meter diagonal line. It's never sideways. It's not side pass, okay? If you wanna make the horse more parallel, very, very simply, you just, instead of having the chest facing the wall, you just ask the chest to face the short side. That's it. And if you get the chest to face the short side, you will be 100% parallel with the wall, 100%. Or you think to yourself, and so then you think, how do I do that? Think, ride. So then you do this. I'm just doing a think three steps. Go diagonal line, then move your seat, and then ride shoulder in on the diagonal line. And that will make you completely parallel to the wall in a leg yield. However, and the big however is, that would be a very, very, very advanced, stupendous, amazing leg yield that you'll get a nine or a 10 for. If you want a six and a half or a seven, you don't even need to add the shoulder in part. Yeah. So for a completely parallel leg yield, Ride a diagonal line, move your seat, ride shoulder in on that diagonal line and you will get a parallel leg yield to the wall. Boom. And you see, guys, none of it was use more outside range. None of it was try harder. It was a clear, succinct system. Ride a diagonal line, step one. Move your seat, step two. Ride shoulder in on that diagonal line, step three. So if you're not quite parallel when you ride, when you ride your shoulder in, what do you think you need to do? Make your shoulder in steeper. That's it. It's literally, that's it. It's that simple. Yeah. When you ride a shoulder in, what happens? The chest goes from facing the letter to facing the short side. That's all that happens. It's that simple. One more question in that, Tash? Yeah, we've got boom, mind blown, amazing, wow. Um, when you move over to leg yield, do you sit even or more pressure in one bum cheek? You sit when you move over to leg yield. Not quite sure what that means. So I suppose if you're on the diagonal line and then you change to leg yield, you reposition your seat. So it's not that you have more weight necessarily. It's just that your center of balance is different. So rather than, so don't think you have to put more weight on your inside seat bone. You just take your, your seat from being directly over the rib, over the backbone to slightly to the inside. You don't actually need to put more pressure or weight there. It's just positioning of your seat in terms of the backbone. Yeah. Anything else there, Tashi? Michelle, um, what do they mean to say when they say inside leg to outside drain? <laughs> Again, I won't talk too much about that in this because we won't get through it all. That's a dressage mastery question. But ultimately, think the easiest way to describe this, and this will ask, ask some questions for you anyway. Horses move away from leg. Nobody would deny that. Every, if you put a leg on the horse, the idea is the horse moves away from it. So if you put your inside leg on, what do you expect your horse to do? He should move sideways, shouldn't he? So then your outside rein then catches that. So do you think that would be the most efficient way to ride inside leg to outside rein? Probably not. The reason why we teach it, and it's a bit of an old English thing, 
It's because it's very, 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 very hard to help people understand that actually both reins are even, you sit evenly in your saddle and that almost you don't have two reins, you've got one big rein. But the only way you can teach that to people is to literally sit down like this and discuss it and discuss it a lot. And that's why dressage mastery is so amazing. And that's why people who, you know, go and live with Olympians for a couple of years, they learn how to really ride well because they can have conversations about it. They have theory. But when you have a traditional lesson, which is just rock up and be yelled at, basically, you don't have that. So inside leg to outside rain is ultimately leg yield and stop it. Leg yield and stop it. What does leg yield give you? Suppleness. What does suppleness give you? Connection, i.e. puts you on the bit. Okay? So it gives people results. Riding inside leg to outside rain does give people results. But when they get to flying changes, when they get to leg yield, when they get to tempi changes, they, they, they get stuck. Because if you ride inside leg to outside rain, then it doesn't work anymore. You end up doing this all the time. And if you don't have a wall to protect you, you've got a really hard outside rain. What I've learned and what I've discovered over the years, because I was taught like that too, is that if you spend time with people, even people who don't know a lot about riding and they're just getting into it and teach them like a Grand Prix rider from the beginning, they can do it. And not only can they do it, it's much more simple and much less complicated, but you have to talk. You have to describe, you have to show. You can't just sit there and scream at them. It's, a, it's, a, it's knowledge versus, um, versus technique. So that's why they use inside leg to outside rain because it does work for amateurs. It really does because it gives you suppleness, which equals connection, which puts a horse on the bit. But, it's, but, it's, but you do reach a level. And how many of you have, have know that as the way you ride and you've never gotten past elementary? Put your little hands up if you know how to do it, little orange hands. I'd like to see how many. But I bet you that there's so many of you here that aren't above elementary. And I would say half of that reason would be that. It's, a, it's not a bad thing. And it's still something that I might use on a real baby, 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 but actually it's a very overcomplicated way of riding and you just don't need to do it. You just need to ride even, even and straight. That's all. But again, that's what Dressage Mastery talks about. And that's why Dressage Mastery is so amazing. And that's why we have so many thousands of members because you can talk about it. You can have a conversation about it. You can debate it. With 100 and, what are we at? 171 people in this group, we can't do that. But you can when there's 20 of us and we can talk about it and you can feel it and you can try it and you can go home and I can give you an analogy and you can try it and go, damn it, she's right. God damn it, it worked. And it's a, such a safe place that you can have these debates. It's fun. No one goes, just shut up and listen because I know what I'm talking about. The point is actually is that you learn stuff so that you and you challenge me and Tash and Megan. You challenge us so that we can teach you the right way so that you can ride by yourself because that's what riding's all about. Riding's about you as a human, as an individual person, having a style and a way of riding. And we give you the knowledge to fit in with your style. If you need a lesson every single week to stay good, there's bigger problems there. How many of you have a great lesson when you're with your hot coach and then ride like crap when you're not? That's because you don't know stuff. It's not because you're a bad rider. It's, it's not because you don't have feel. It's because you just don't know enough. We can teach you. And it's not a whole pile of random tools or tricks. It's a philosophy. It's a way of riding. It's the training scale. It's physics. And it's the same. I, um, anyone from Dressage Mastery, when I just did an interview with one of, I don't really teach one-on-one -on -one very often, but I've, I've been teaching Toby. And as I said, an into one rider. And 
I started teaching him because I sent him off for let. He said, can I have lessons? And I'm like, nah. So I sent him off to a very famous Olympian in the UK to do it. Cause I'm like, I don't have time teaching, go and have lessons with them. And he came back and he said, Leach, I don't understand and they can do it and I can't. And when I ask them questions, they can't explain it. And I know I'm not doing it because he knows enough to know what's good and what's bad. Can you help me? I'm like, oh, all right. And then I helped him and just by, and it wasn't, it's the discussion. And I did, and even though he's riding it, we're working on Piaf and Passage and big movements. It's this discussion, guys. It's this stuff. It's working on both, you know, um, Mowgli, our OTT horse, our off the track horse. I'm the only one who likes riding him and I love riding him. And they always laugh at me going, why do you want to like riding the shittest horse in the stable? And I'm like, because he wants to do it and you can feel it and you can get it. You can make progress really quickly. It's fun. And since I've been ch training Tobes, he's done a 360 and also loves riding um, Mowgli. And I didn't teach him on Mowgli. I gave him two or three messages, uh, messages, lessons on G, talked about basic stuff. It's all this basic stuff we talked about. And then he was able to apply that to an off the track horse without me even in the stables. And it was a horse that he hates riding. And he sent me a message gushing about how great it was. And that's what, I, that's what riding should be about. You should be able to enjoy it not feel silly that you don't know things. And that's, that's what my goal is for you guys here is to teach you knowledge so that you can reach out and get help, but you can also just enjoy your horses independently and do it in your own way. Because that's what makes Carl brilliant versus and different to Edward and different to um, um, Isabel Worth and, and different to Dorothy. They're all different, but equally as good because they know stuff and then they have their own way. Anyway, that got a bit off tangent. <laughs> Any other thing in there, Tashi, or am I good to move forward? Oh, good. Now we've got a lot, lots of different things. Can you clarify where you reposition seat in leg yield? Direction you're going or other direction? Other direction. So you go away from the direction you're going. So you think to yourself, I reposition my seat. So I'm creating space where I want to go. That's the key. And Another then one, we've got, um, I know you have not talked about the banana at all in this. Is it the same system? It's exactly the same system, guys. And we're coming to that. We just haven't got to a point yet where, we're, where the horse bends in the rib cage too much. Everything's been relatively straight. Anything else? That's the next step. Um, from South Kia, I have a big problem to control the left shoulder. The teacher told me to put on the knee. Is it correct? No, it's not connect correct. And if you're bulging in the left shoulder, yeah, that means that your reins aren't even. So if you're bulging in the left shoulder, that means he's falling out. So one thing that you can do straight away is put a little bit of weight. Oh, sorry, no, I'm assuming the left shoulders. So if, so if he's bulging to the left shoulder, he's going to always be falling left. So one thing that you can do immediately is sit more to the left. And if you sit more to the left, that will automatically straighten him up. Okay. And your reins should just be exactly the same. Okay. And again, that's where dressage mastery is good. You send us a video and then you, we'd say, put yourself here. And what you can do as well, it's a bit off track, so, but I'll say it, counterflex. So if you're, if he's bulging to the left, get him to look to the left and do it yourself. If you do this and then you look to the left, it, it, it makes your shoulders pick up. You're here, you do that, you fall more. You put your head in the middle, you're better. You look left and you literally, your shoulders come up. And do it yourselves, guys, because you might think I'm exaggerating that. I'm not. Fall left and then look left and, you hit, and your shoulders just come up. It works the same with the horses. Yeah. All right. We're going to move on there, otherwise we won't get through it all, okay? The next step is proper lateral work. So travers, shoulder in, ronvers. Okay, now I've got some little 
props here to help you. You've got four legs, okay? So you've got, let's move this over here so you can see it. That is heavier than I thought it was. <laughs> so you've got four legs on your pony, like so. Everyone can see that, perfect, okay? So shoulder in, bring the ins, bring your legs like this. So you go from having two tracks, which is your front legs and your hind legs in line with each other, to your outside hind, this one here, being all by itself, your inside hind and your outside front leg here, and your inside front leg all by itself. So you've got three tracks, okay? So if you do that as a human, you guys can do it as well. You think I've got all of my tracks, I've got my two, basically two tracks. So I've got front legs and hind legs in line with each other. If I move them to the inside, what happens to my rib cage? The inside gets smaller, the outside gets fatter, okay? So again, let's do it if you can see me. I'll take one layer off. It has gotten particularly cold. What is it? Three degrees. <laughs> so I'm on the wall. This is where we should be, okay? So before you can even start lateral work, you need to make sure that this is what your horse looks like. Ultimately, if you're going up a wall and you're looking at you face on, you should only see your front leg, nothing more. Okay, when you move the shoulder in, that happens. Okay, so it's like this. What happens to this rib cage? It gets smaller. What happens to this rib cage? It gets bigger. Now, what did we learn when we were turning circles? We learned that when you turn a circle, the outside rib cage gets slightly bigger and how bodies move to that bigger area, that bigger center of gravity. Okay. So you have to be aware of that when you ask for shoulder in, that here I'm in the middle of the rib cage. If I do nothing and I move the shoulder in, I'll be sitting out here on this big rib cage. So you need to move your body so that you're still on the center of the backbone, okay? So again, have a think about where my backbone is. Then I move my shoulder over. You need to move your body so that you're still on the center of that backbone, okay? What that feels like and what you can do actively is just when you ride shoulder in, you sit to the small part of the banana or the small part of the rib cage. So just before you think shoulder in, you think lift your seat, move it to where I want the smallest part of the rib cage to be and then move my shoulders over, okay? So shoulder in to the right, I'd be here. I'd move my seat to there. Then I move the shoulders over. Shoulder into the left. I'd be here over the center over my, my um, backbone. I'd move my seat to the left. Then I move my shoulders over. And this is, that's why I always talk about the banana. Everyone can picture what a banana looks like. If you can't remember where to sit, sit where the smallest part of the rib cage is, okay? If you ride a wrong bear, so you have normal, straight, and then have shoulder in. So I've gone from straight, I've moved my seat slightly to the left, and I've moved my shoulders to the left. So I'm on three tracks. That is shoulder in. To make it wrong there, Shoulder in, my feet are like this, but the inside rib cage is little and the outside rib cage is big. To make it wrong there, all I do is keep the feet in the same spot, but I move the rib cage. So this rib cage ends up becoming big and this rib cage ends up becoming small. So if I'm riding a shoulder in, to change it to a wrong there, I'm gonna have to go from sitting to the left to sitting to the right and then move my rib cage. And you even saw just then my rib cage did it naturally. I'm sitting to the left, I'm riding shoulder in. I move my seat in preparation for the rhombus. 
Look at it. It already changed my rib cage. Just like that. Yeah. Travis, you're here. You want the quarters to come in. Okay. Already you can see this is the smallest part of the rib cage. So while you're riding along, you just think to yourself, I always have to sit to the small part of the rib cage and remembering why, because the why is always so important. The reason why I'm doing that is because if I don't physically move, I will actually no longer be on the top of the backbone. I'll end up on the biggest part of the rib cage, which will have you sitting over here. So when you see lots of people do half pass, you'll often see them way over here while the half pass is going and they look like crooked to the outside. That's because they haven't moved their seat to make sure that they're always straddling that backbone right in the middle. So for your feeling, you always go, where's the small part of the banana? I need to sit in it. Not like this. Weight still even in my feet. Just positioning of where your, where your actual bottom sits. Here, small part of the banana. Here, small part of the banana. Right? Now, we've got two questions here. I can go further up the levels or we can troubleshoot and ask loads of questions at this level that we've done. I think the easiest way to ask is, is there anybody, and just write in the comments now, that is at a higher level than this right now. And while we're waiting for those comments to come in, we've got a question from Ruth. Yep. Do I have this correct? When you start the leg yield, let's say start at X and ride to K, you first start with the horse's chest going to K, right? Not shoulder to K and chest straight. So uh, what was the person's name, sorry? Ruth. Ruth, Ruth? Ruth, yeah. Ruth. Ruth, when you ride it seamlessly, all three steps will be done at X in a half a step, yeah? But when you're learning it, it's okay to take longer. So when you first ride a leg yield, you might do it from X to K, for example, and you might go step one, diagonal line from X to K. Then you might go step two, do it again, step two, X to K and move my seat. And then step three, add shoulder in. Eventually, when you get quick and good and understand it a little bit like you, you know how to read a watch, you know, it's that easy. All of those three steps would be done invisibly in a, an eighth of a meter at X if that makes sense. So I break it down in big three big clear steps for you. And when you're learning, it's important that you do each, each of those three parts of the steps clear and correct. And then as you get better, you get more efficient and you can do them all almost simultaneously. So then it becomes invisible. So then yes, to do a, a, a 10 out of 10 leg yield from X, from your horse's chest, ultimately wouldn't change from the center line. He'd go up the center line and then across the diagonal, but his chest would still be facing the front like it was when he was going down the center line. Hope that answered it. Yeah, perfect. So we've got a lot of basics, um, not at high level. And then we've got one trying to perfect second level test two and three and flying change. Okay, cool. So um, let's ask a few more questions then at this level and then we'll go and talk about that as well. There's no point in me talking about PF if no one's PFing. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, throw a few more questions at me, um, Tashi. Okay, so um, when I start a shoulder in, shall I think and make the first steps like if I would go into a circle or shall I just use the reins? Say that again. When I start a shoulder in, Shall I think and make the first steps like if I would go on to a circle or shall I just use the brain? So that's a bit of a weird question for me because the first part of it's right, yeah. 
you could, if you wanted to, think to yourself, I'm going to turn a 10 metre circle and then sort of abort mission and don't. So that's why a lot of people begin shouldering out of a corner because you kind of like ride a quarter of a circle and then the wall, then you just continue up the wall, but keep the position. But that is done with your rein, not with your legs. That is done with just feeling the basic, riding your train tracks basically is how you do that. So the first part of your answer is that question is correct, but I don't quite understand the second part because you do use your rein. So you, yes, you always use your rein and it is the same aid as if you were to turn a circle and then not is the same aid for leg yield, for um, shouldering. It's exactly the same aid. So if you're riding up the wall, you would eat to turn an eight meter or 10 meter volte or something like that would be the same aid as it would be to do a shoulder in on the wall. Except when you turn on the volte, you're telling the horse where to go 10 meters ahead and that's on the circle line. And when you ride on the wall, you're telling the horse to just keep going straight. But the way you move your shoulders off the wall with your reins is exactly the same way. It's exactly the same aid. Throw another one at me, Tashi. Yeah, so Mimi said, and this won't affect his train tracks. No, because all you're actually doing is moving the train track. So you... Ah. Here we go. This is a good train track. <laughs> so you're going up the wall and this is your train tracks. Yeah. To ride a shoulder in, you go from I'm going straight to that and that becomes your shoulder in, okay? Yes, there's a bendy rib cage in between and that just happens um, physically. That, that's nothing to do with you. You don't create that bend in the rib cage. But if you're riding, you just imagine you've got a surfboard just like this and you're going shoulder in. Now I'm going, sorry, you're going straight. Now I'm going shoulder in. If you're going to turn a circle, you go up the wall and then you'd go four diamond. One, two, three, four. Straight again. So you this, both sides of this is your train tracks. And you saw no matter what I did, travel, shoulder in, circle, bomb, 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 bomb keeps the train tracks the whole time. And the rib cage will bend automatically through whatever line you're doing, but your feet stay on these train tracks no matter what. And that's how you ride your lines. You don't create bend. The lines create bend yourself, themselves. So if you need more bend on a circle, you ride a smaller circle. If you ride, need more bend in a shoulder in, you create more angle and that gives you more bend. But the horse itself, you ride like a train track, like this. I'm up a wall, shoulder in. Oh, but you don't put the heart. So I'm on the wall, shoulder in. I want a circle. One, two, three, four sections of the diamond. I don't do this. And the bend in the rib cage that the lines do will give you the circle shape. Everyone remembers that diamond that you learn in pony club. Or well, hopefully you do. That is how you ride a circle. The, 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 cir the circle shape bit comes naturally because of the line. It's quite amazing. And the straighter you ride, the more flexibility and bend you get in the rib cage because the more stable the horse is. The more the horse is drifting and going sideways, the more his body is like this, versus this okay often when people ride a wall or a circle they'll ride the wall like this and the horse is upright and then when they turn the circle the horse starts to do this that's not what should happen when you ride a straight line and then you ride a circle your horse's body should stay like this and just follow the circle around never should it go like this ever imagine anyone who's australian will be able to do this imagine the sand at a beach when your feet are in the sand and well let me let me say that better 
You know, when you're at the beach and you've got that hard sand down near the water and you walk on it and you get like a footprint, but you don't, you go on it. You don't sink into it. You want to imagine your horse walking along that and that every single foot that they put into that sand is exactly the same depth. So if they're going, if they're drifting like this with their shoulders a little bit, one leg won't be as heavy on the ground as another leg. Yeah? So that's your train tracks. That is this, that all four legs are always in line with each other and that they're always in the same place and that you're not drifting, you're not doing this and your train tracks aren't getting wider and thinner and wider and thinner. They're just boom. Fire some more at me, Tashi. Yeah. Um, I've started learning pirouettes, but I struggle to keep my horse in canter. He falls out of rhythm. This. Train tracks. That's all it is. All it is is that when you're doing the pirouette, you'll be stepping sideways. If you go sideways when you're doing a pirouette, you can't do it. So first preparation for pirouette is you need to be on the wall and you should be able to collect your canter enough that I could have a leisurely stroll beside you, that I could walk beside you. If you can't collect your canter enough on a straight line, that somebody could walk beside you, you're not ready for a pirouette. Cool. Uh, next one. The lateral movement works on or to the left side, but she loses the rhythm on the right side. She does half steps very good, but we don't come good out. Is it a suppleness problem? And what can I do? Okay, so two questions there. To say that one more time, Tash. The lateral movement works on or to the left side, but she loses the rhythm on the right side. Okay, so that's a suppling issue. So if they can move one way and it's acceptable and the other way they can't, it means that on that side, they've got a lack of suppleness, okay? And a lack of suppleness will often represent as a lack of rhythm. So you need to abort mission when that happens because you're going too steep for what the horse can do, okay? So that's really important. And a horse that behaves like that, you shouldn't do short steps with them yet because that is why you can't get her out. Because to be able to do short steps and then get out of the short steps, you need to have control over both hips, both hind legs. So if one way she can do it, what the other way she can't, when you're in short steps and you're trying to get out, you've got a way, you've only got one chance. When, one, when the good leg hits the ground, you've got control. When the sticky leg hits the ground, you've got no control. And that's why you find it hard to get out. So you, what you need to do is go away from short steps until you've got to even both ways and you've got influence both ways. Then when you do your short steps, if you feel her starting to get stuck and she won't go out, you don't, it's not a forward thing. You need to leg yield it into her sticky way. That will make her take a big step and that gets you to get out and that will keep a nice smooth transition. So in a nutshell, suppleness. Yep. Um, could a horse be so unbalanced that he doesn't respond to these aids? Yes, is the answer. Um, and the Mowgli videos, we were writing the OTT will help you with that. But the aids don't change because the aids aren't buttons. The aids are um, manifestations of physics. So the only thing that would change for a horse to not be able to do this stuff is the length of time in which they can do it. So you might find, for example, even something as simple as going up the wall, you might find that you can't do that, that you don't have control enough about with that horse to keep him just to ride a straight line against the wall. So what do you do? You would turn a circle, yeah, to make him more supple, to make him more connected into the bridle. And then when you reach the wall, you go forward again and you might get nowhere. And if you got nowhere, you'd immediately abort mission, turn a circle again, using all the things you've learned with your seat, using your weight, making sure that you help him. So if he's struggling to turn, you got to put more weight to the inside to allow room for his outside rib cage to get bigger. You'd hit the wall. And then if you're getting nothing before and you could get 10 centimeters straight the next time, awesome. 
And then as soon as you lose it, you move and you change again. So the exercises and the corrections are all the same. It may just feel like you're getting nowhere because you're wanting them to do 20 meters or five meters. If they're really unbalanced, you may only get a half a meter. And that's where understanding where to sit and understanding balance of your horse and understanding train tracks and what you want the feet to do helps you figure that out from horse to horse to horse. So that you don't need a coach to tell you every single time. You can be on your horse going, okay, he won't go straight up the wall because I don't have weight in all four feet. He's got more weight in his two inside legs what's an exercise I can do to get him to put more weight to the outside legs? Ah, I need to make the outside rib cage bigger so I could turn a circle. Oh, I've tried to turn a circle. He won't or he can't. What can I do in my body to make his outside rib cage bigger? I can give it space. Therefore, I move my, my, my body. So what I try to teach you is all of these tools but they're, but they're not tricks. They're not do this with this horse, do this with this horse. It's just putting all the pieces of the puzzle together so that you can always work out what you need to do so that you don't need me. My ultimate goal is that one of you beat me in the arena one day. I mean, what a friggin' win would that be? I'd love that. As long as you were one of my dressage mastery people. Um, <laughs> But if I made that happen, then that's a win for me. If you need your coach to answer those simple questions, you, you're not learning. You're not learning. You're just a puppet. I want it, it's, it's, And it's all simple stuff. It's all physics that you can deduce and work out for yourself. And, are, and it's always the same. So yes is the answer. And the key is, is to understand why. Perfect. Next one. Um, a four-leg yield. I was told to move my reins toward the direction of travel. Is this correct? Now, I wish I could. There wasn't so many people in the group, but I'd make you say that back to me. If you push your reins in the direction of travel, what would happen to the shoulder? So if you wanted to go to the wall this way and you push your reins this way, it's going to encourage the shoulder to go there, isn't it? So the shoulder is going to go like this, correct? Yeah. If the shoulder goes like that, where does the hind leg go? Out here. So you end up like you end up quarters, quarters trailing. So that movement will actually encourage quarters trailing because you're actually literally asking the horse's quarters to trail. So no is the answer. You actually do nothing, or if you want a more parallel one, you push your shoulders away from the direction of travel. Because think of it, you want the horse to be parallel to the wall. To make a horse parallel to the wall, where does his chest need to be? Facing the short side. If you push his chest to face the way you're, where you're going, how is it possible for him to ever be parallel? And if I could see your face and talk to you like I do with my dress as mastery stuff, and also we will do in these Pilates courses, I'll actually talk that through and ask you the questions that you know, you'll be surprised, you know the answer to. You know the answer that if I want my horse's chest, if I want my horse to be parallel to the wall, he can't look at the wall. Everybody in this group will know that. So then why would you ask him to look at the wall? Which by pushing your reins that way would encourage. Perfect. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, all right, from Carol. Sometimes I ride a horse that has a neck as long as a giraffe and quite stiff when he tilts his head, not bend. How do I correct that? Do I use my leg or is it that I have my seat in the wrong position? Neither really. That's a whole nother level. And that is dressage mastery, not really Pilates. But again, but in a nutshell, to make a neck, a long horse shorter, you need to move the hind leg closer to the front. So a really good rule of thumb is if you want to fix anything from the wither forward, solve it from the wither back. Okay? And that might not necessarily be 
energy, it might be the rib cage. So therefore a shoulder in, if you ride a shoulder in, the hind leg gets closer to the front, et cetera, et cetera. The head tilt that they do, like where their pole stays here and then their nose comes out a bit like that, that's just an evasion from connection. So if you solve the connection, which is behind the shoulder, that will solve itself. So remember, if you hate the front end, if, you, if, you, if there's something about the shoulder to the nose that you hate, you solve it from the shoulder to the hind. Perfect. We've got some thank yous. And um, Annette asks, how do I get a horse into a slower trot? So maybe if we've got a seat answer for that. Yes. And there's a good answer for that. So then now this is Pilates, guys. And this comes back down to this bit. I wish you guys could see Jeff. He looks so cute. Um, so this comes back to this bit, okay? When you have control of your seat and you can do it, you can control the trot because you can control it with your rise, whether it's slower or faster. But when you're a passenger and you're riding your rising trot from your thighs, yeah, or you're rolling like this, you are completely at the mercy of whatever trot they're doing. You can't supersede it. If you're riding like I showed you with your pelvis down, your feet in your stirrups or your feet on the ground and you go up or down, you can, you have, how fast the horse is going has zero influence to you. And actually in the course, we give you exercises to strengthen you. So for example, you do a rising trot and I get you to go down for three, up for six, down for one, up for eight. And I just scream out random different tempos that's or sorry, random different rhythms that's outside of the horse of what they're doing. And you'd be amazed by how much control you can have over it. So then once you've got that exercise and you've got that strength, if you've got a horse that's going fast, all you've got to do is rise slower and they'll meet your rhythm. Horses will always come back to your rhythm because they don't want to be uncomfortable. It's as simple as that. So all, so yeah, so learning that pelvis, twist and then riding with 80% in your feet, that is how you change the tempo. Just like that. You'll be absolutely amazed. Horses that pissed off on you before or to the contrary were super, super, super slow. It was because you were always following them. You get to start to lead them and you just go that you have in your brain. This is the tempo I want to go and you start moving. The horse will follow. Simple as that. And you'd be amazed again. You're all probably sitting there again going, bullshit. <laughs> I call BS, Leashy. I call BS. That's why I have the money back guarantee because it ain't. It is just not BS. It works. You'll be amazed. It's, that's the beauty of dressage. I don't know why, but everybody makes it so complicated. It's not complicated. It's so easy. It's so easy. And there's a system to everything. There's an answer to everything. Sure, maybe you need a bit of talent and a bit of tweak and a bit of um, speed in the way you think to make to take your horse from a, six and a, a 65 Grand Prix test to an 80 Grand Prix test. Okay. But in my brain, anybody, anybody can ride a 65 Prince at George test. Anybody, anybody. And I really do mean anybody anybody i can't say it enough i've trained with para riders to that level like ladies people with no legs not two legs but missing one leg um you know few spines it's it's simple P grand prix is a little bit harder but not because of the technique just actually because of how quickly you have to think that's actually the only thing that makes grand prix harder is not actually riding it it's the speed in which you've got to think there's, there's no rest lines in the whole test. Almost every single line is an activity, which is very, very difficult. Whereas small tour, honestly, if your horse can do it and you understand, small tour is easier than prelim. Much easier. It's just straight lines everywhere. It's so much easier. But we all make out that it's this big, scary thing. It's not, guys. But nobody teaches like this. 
we used to back in the day you know you used to you speak, i remember hating pony club because this is what they did you know you had to do theory and then you got to ride at the end of the day now it's all for the consumer the consumer goes i want to ride i want to ride i want to ride i want to ride but actually you need to ride less and learn more if you gave me a million dollars to get you to pre st george any of you and you you said to me um um i'll give you a million dollars if you do it what would i do i would put you on your horse twice a week and you sorry i, I preface that and say i've got an hour a day five days a week so you Get a million dollars to put you, make you a pre-St. George rider. And I've got you for one hour every day, five times a week. I would put you on your horse twice a week and talk to you the rest of the time. If there was a million dollars on the line. And I know I would get you there more likely if I just taught you on your horse five days a week. Because it's not, it, it, it's not about that. It's about what you know. That's it. How many bad Grand Prix riders out there can you think of? That you think, you look at them and you think, I do not want to ride like that. That's horrific. But guess what, guys? They're still riding Grand Prix because they know stuff. And that's honestly the truth. It shows, and how many amazing riders are there at Prelim that you think, oh my gosh, they're beautiful. I want to ride like that. But they don't leave Prelim because they don't know stuff. And the only way really, I don't know of another way, the only way really other than what we do at the moment to know this stuff is to go and live your life, live and breathe horses for five years with an Olympian. And even then, you've got to be bold enough to ask questions. You've got to be bold enough to go, hey, I watched you ride X horse. Then I watched you teach the owner on X horse and you told them two totally different things. What you did and what you got them to do was two totally different things. Why? And that's how I learned is just asking, asking, asking. That's why so many people go to Europe and don't come back any better because it's not enough just to be there. You've got to ask too. What I'm hoping to do is to change the industry by giving you all the stuff that I know and teaching it to you from the beginning and giving you the confidence that you're not that you can do it. And I guarantee that, guys. I guarantee it. I will get you, you could go to pre-St. George just with knowledge. If you can walk, trot and canter and stay on, if you're at that level, walk, trot, canter, not fall off, look pretty neat, you know, not be, not be too demonstrative to the way the horse goes, you could learn pre-St. George just by, just by talking and practicing. Because it's all it is, is just what you know. If I'm getting bad, at, and everyone does, if I get bad at my riding, I stop riding, I teach people, and then when I get back, I'm better. Learned that a long time ago. If I'm having a bad moment, because you do, everyone gets stuck in the moment, I stop riding, like literally stop riding, and then I teach people. And since I've been doing the YouTube and I don't just teach I talk oh my god every time I ride I'm so much better I didn't ride for a month over Christmas and Toby's like when I he came in and I was riding and don't forget the horses also had the month off they were just hacking Toby's like you're the only person I know that can have a month off with the horses and on day three be just as good if not better than you were when you stopped riding them every day it's because it's just a system. And even though the horses haven't done the work for a month, as long as they're staying fit, moving their bodies, cardiovascularly fit, muscles fit, you just apply the system, they can do the work. It's the most brilliant thing I've ever learned. Learn, learn, learn. Okay, next bit, Tash. <laughs> and Tash, you need to keep me an eye on time as well. Where am I at? Yeah, I was gonna say, we've got 10 minutes left. Okay. Um, couple of questions um how do you ride Ron Vare in canter oh same thing exactly the same thing and this is a really great one because people think how can I ride Ron Vare with canter because if I put my inside leg back they're going to do a flying change the whole point is 
People think that Ron Ver is quarters out. It's not. So think about a shoulder in, okay? And then all you have to do is change the bend to the wall, but the feet don't change. The quarters aren't out, guys. It just gives that illusion. So to ride a canter, so ride a Ron Ver and canter, which is an exquisitely useful aid, very, very, very useful. It is exactly the same as trot. I'm riding a shoulder in. All I do to make it Ron Ver is change the bend, which doesn't affect how your legs are. And as soon as you don't put your, out, your, your legs back, then the horse won't change leads. Yeah. Before we get going, that one person that was, um, that was pirouettes, which I answered, and then flying changes as well, Tash? Yes. So flying changes and tempi changes, you've got to, it's exactly the same as a walk to canter. So when we learnt before about where to position your seat, it's exactly the same principle. You just pretend you're doing a walk to canter, it's the same aid, except you're doing a, except you're in canter. So when you give the aid, you want to make sure that you reposition your body slightly so that the new leading leg has space and actually that the old leading leg doesn't have space. So then you're stopping it both ways, yeah? So if you're cantering to the uh, right and you want to do a flying change to the left, you're sitting in the small bit of the banana here on the right and this is the leading leg, okay? When you want to canter to the left, this leg is going to be the leading leg. So before you do it, you're going to move your position so that you're centered over the backbone to the new leading leg, which means that you're sitting on the one that you want to cease going and giving space to the new one. And that will help you get cleaner, easier changes. Yeah. I hope that is the flying change question. Yes. Now, is that is Hannah? How do you ride with eighty percent of weight in your feet if you're riding without stirrups or bareback? Well, then that's not dressage anymore. So that's the answer, basically. So we ride with stirrups when we compete, and we ride with a saddle when we compete. So when you're riding without stirrups or without a saddle then it's not dressage, it's just improving balance in your seat. So it's not actually for the purpose of riding correctly and having influence on your horse, et cetera, et cetera. It's an exercise to give you balance with, no, with, with little to no support. So without stirrups, you've got little support. With no stirrups, you've got, sorry, with no saddle, you've got no support. So it, that, that's not how you compete. There's no such thing as a no stirrups, no saddle dressage test. That's because you couldn't ride dressage bareback. Doesn't mean you can't do the movements, et cetera. You'll see me, I've got these videos of me doing one tempies and PF and everything bareback on Wessel. It's not to say you can't do it, but you can't ride dressage correctly with it. The exercises of bareback and out stirrups are balanced things. It's just to increase your natural balance and your ability to stay on anything no matter what happens. Your ability to just be able to save your body and be with it. That's all it is. Um, and when we're children, we do it a lot because children bounce. <laughs> and, um, and personally, I'm very against um, adults riding without stirrups or riding without saddles. Because it doesn't act, to me, I don't actually think it achieves what it's supposed to achieve. All it does is makes you afraid and makes you grip in all the wrong areas. Kids, I fully endorse it because kids are loose, fearless and bounce when they fall off. So they break less limbs they, and, and they just, they do this, I guess, this ridiculous, amazing balance. It's such a good thing for children to play with. But as an adult learner, I don't believe that no stirrups really helps you. I think it hinders you. That's my opinion. And again, if you think of the theory about it now with your pelvis, et cetera, what does it really achieve? It works for a kid that's 20 kilos doesn't work for a fully grown woman with a massive rack and a hundred kilos. It just doesn't. 
<laughs> it just doesn't. But it's an old fashioned thing that people do from writing school days, you know? And yeah, there's all those challenges out there where, you know, can I do one tempies without a stirrup, without stirrups, et cetera. And yeah, you'll see videos of me riding Wessel bareback and with a halter on and things like that. But they're, they're from riders that like me, like I didn't even own a saddle till I was 10. You know, we were brought up with that so we can do it. It's just a trick. It doesn't actually make you a better rider if you're doing it as an adult. Definitely children, but not as an adult. And if you think about it, it's logical that it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay, Carol, what did I mean when they say sit deeper in the feet if I have 80% of the weight in my feet? Again, they're just trying to get you to sit on your seat bone. It's all just incorrect articulation. Um, something that, again, I've learned from the dressage mastery groups is, and the Pilates group that I did last time, is I made it really clear. I say to you guys, I'm very, very happy to be anonymous and I'm very, very happy for your coaches on the ground to take credit for anything that I've taught you. It doesn't bother me because... My goal is for you to learn, not for me to get kudos. It's cool. And also, your coaches can get you a bit of backup if you go somewhere else. So I encourage you to not tell anybody. And quite often, they just want, they're just trying to articulate a correct position to you. And they use words like open your hips, sit deeper in the saddle, sit heavier in the saddle. That's actually not what they want you to do. It's just the it's just what it's just their words to try to get you to do what they want you to do so I challenge you you try this try your moving your pelvis try all this Pilates exercises that I teach you within the course because what 100 there was 170 people here all of you are doing the course if you're here right now follow that and then go and have your lesson and I guarantee you coaches go finally you're doing it you've listened to what I said it's just that they don't know how to articulate it when people say stick your boobs out they do not want you to do this they don't want you to have an arch in your back of course they don't but they don't know how else to stop you from doing this with your shoulders or leaning forward they're just doing their very very best to try and get you in a better position but we, but you as riders take it so literally. They th you think that riding is put your tits out. You think riding is sit heavier in the saddle. It's not. They're versions of things that they're telling you to get you to do something else. They're, they're corrections that they're telling you to try to correct your way to do it. Okay? If that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. And that is really, really hard when you're teaching. It's so hard when you're learning and you're, and you're coaching to try to, if I ever tell, so I might tell someone if I'm teaching them, um, okay, I want you to make your outside rein. Um, I might say, put, I never say it right outside or inside, actually. I might say to make your right rein 10 centimetres shorter than your left. And the reason why I'd say that is because they're so crooked, but, but when you're crooked, no one does this on purpose. They do this unwillingly. They don't know that they're doing this. They think they're straight. So I tell them to ride one rein 10 centimetres shorter because for their feeling, that's what it will feel like. And that actually makes them straight. But I always make sure I preface that with that, that this isn't how you should ride. You shouldn't ride with one rein 10 centimetres shorter than the other. But I'm telling you this because every time I say make straighter reins, you don't. So for your feeling, your feeling is wrong. This is what correct is. And I just say what I have to say to get them to find that correct place. And that's all the other coaches are saying when they say things like sit deeper, stick your boobs out, those sorts of things. They just don't have the vocabulary to teach, to, to guide you through it exactly. And to be fair to coaches, I don't either when you're teaching you when you're on your horse. There's so many other things to do. You, you, you need this time to discuss it, to talk about it.
to let you go and try it and come back with questions. It's not possible to learn dressage in a lesson. It's just not. It's just not. You need to be able to discuss and understand and ask questions and, and question it and be devil's advocate, so to speak, until you understand. Until your coach goes either, fine, you got me, I was wrong. Not in that instance, which sometimes even I do that. Or I've convinced you that I'm correct and you've tried it and you've made it work. But you can't do that while you're trotting and cantering around. It's not possible for both you and coach. All right. So are you literally lifting your seat out of the saddle to move your seat to the inside or outside of the spine to help the horse rebalance when they mm -hmm. fold their shoulders in or out? Or is it more of a shift in your upper body? Never a shift in your upper body ever, 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 ever. It's only your pelvis. And when you're learning, you may need to, yes, lift your whole pelvis out of the saddle and then move it over so that you actually don't move your upper body. But as you get better, no, you'll be able to just slide your pelvis over invisibly without moving your upper body. But the lesser of two evils, and I always say when you're learning and when you're riding in general, actually, it's never perfect. So you're better off giving yourself a mistake that you're allowed to make versus a mistake that versus trying not to do something, if that makes sense. So the lesser of two evils is if I can't move my pelvis without moving my upper body, then stand up, move over, sit down again and work on over time being able to do that without moving your upper body. Yeah. Dash, more questions? <laughs> yes, we have a got. How do I improve my PF with my seat? Say that again. How do I... Improve my PF with my seat. Ah, you don't. That's the answer. If you've got a horse that can't PF, for, for example, when I taught Wessel PF, I taught him in rising. I did rising PF, got out of the saddle. The lighter you are in the saddle, the quicker the hind leg can go. So you want to be light in your saddle. You want to be effortless in your saddle, especially in PF. Piaf is supposed to be the pinnacle of self-carriage. So at Piaf, the horse should be um, very, very light and he should almost be barely touching his back to get the Piaf. If you don't have that, it means he's not quick enough in the hind leg, which means he's ultimately not collected enough, which ultimately means he's not straight enough. So actually to make him quicker, his shoulders will actually be a little bit like this. You need to make his shoulders more upright. The heavier you sit, the worse your PF will get. And even if you can make it quicker a bit by sitting hard, you won't be able to do a smooth transition because it'll be false, be fake, be forced. You have done it. You are That's amazing. It. Morning, first ever coaching session. Love all your videos. Great class. Makes sense. No more. Oh, we've got one more question just come through. Yep. So when you ride a circle, you only move your seat if the horse falls in or out. Otherwise, you over the middle of his seat bone. Yep. You always just, you always, just, when you're riding, check and make sure that you're straddling his backbone. That you're, again, I'm so sorry for the crassness of it, but your bottom crack is right sitting, like you could pick up his backbone with your bum cheek. <laughs> and you just constantly check, am I there? Am I there? Am I there? Make sense? Perfect. Good guys, job. I can't thank you enough for today. I'm so glad you loved it, guys. I really did. And as I said, I'm so um, uh, heartwhelmed that you, um, that a thousand people were here. It's just crazy. Um, you know, and, and even if you don't buy programs and things like that, I just hope that you can pay this forward because this information everybody should know and it's not complicated. It is easy. You just need to have someone who gives you the time to tell you. And those people who said you've learned more in the past 10 years, to be fair though, who's sat in front of you for three hours and just talked to you? Probably never.
So it's not me, guys. It's the way we do it. It's the it's just giving you that time and that that clear focus on what you're doing. Okay. I have absolutely loved this, guys. Thank you so, so much for being here. And if you have any questions, if you want to say anything, jump on the social media or send us an email. Kisses. Mwah. Bye, guys. So how exciting was that, guys? I hope you enjoyed it. I do do seminars like that periodically throughout the year. So if you've never been to one, feel free to come next time. And remember, write down below anything that you thought was like this gold nugget of excitement and put it down below and then maybe I can do a segment just on that. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Don't forget about the 500 prize, 500 pound prize. If you don't know what that is, just check underneath and I'll see you on Thursday. Mwah. Bye, guys.